everybody. I'd like to thank you for joining our panel on student success today. Um, my name is Sung Kim. I'm the VP of Corporate Development and Strategy at Chegg. Um, today we're joined by a fantastic group of distinguished panelists uh, who represent various facets of our education industry and all serve students and their pursuit for success in many different ways. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, we should start with panel introductions. Maybe John, you can start when we come down this way. Sure. So afternoon, I'm John Dobberton. I'm the Senior Vice President of Academic Success for 2U. Hi there. I'm John Medley. I'm the Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management at Wayne State. Um, I'm also the only girl on the panel. You don't say. <laughs> 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 uh, Drew Maliazzi, CEO of AdmitHub. We build conversational AI for college success. I'm Preston Silverman, co-founder and CEO of RaiseMe, a platform that helps students get scholarships and grants for college. Uh, Drew Gant, co-founder and CEO of WiseAnt. We are a uh, tutoring marketplace. It's been around for about 14 years, but just entered the higher ed partnership student retention space in the last couple of years. Great. Thank you. Well, given the wide range of expertise uh, and focus areas of our panels here, I think it gives us a unique opportunity to zoom out and evaluate holistically uh, what student success should mean um, in light of our understanding of the modern student and their journey today. And it also allows us to discuss uh, technology's role in helping us achieve student success to, to disseminate student success and to scale it. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to give you uh, some quick stats on the modern student and the world they're living in. Um, so if we take a hundred, a cohort of a hundred high school students and look at them over the next 10 years, uh, by four years down the line, 80 of them will graduate from high school. Uh, 56 will immediately enroll in college. And over the course of the ensuing six years, just 32 will graduate. Um, of the 32 that graduate, only 19 will have jobs that are commensurate with their degree. So we're talking about, of these 100 students, 81 of them who have fallen behind, fallen out, or rounded up in jobs uh, they didn't need a degree for. And they're all entering a workforce where there are 45 million people who collectively owe $1.6 trillion in student debt. Um, zooming back into the college students, 73% of them are also working. 62% of them say that they have real financial concerns. 62% say they have academic concerns. 43% say they felt very, very lonely. And 30% tell us they've fallen in love. So as you look at <laughs> the realities, the demographic, the social, the academic and emotional realities of modern students, how might we reimagine uh, student success by both its definition and its measurement? And how do we look at the whole student from college entrance to getting to completion to even entering the career? And then how do we make that replicable and scalable? So that's, again, uh, where I think we'll have some good discussion around the role of technology. So with that in mind, um, I'd, I'd love to just kick it off uh, and ask kind of Preston the question here, which is, um, you know, at Raise Me, you see students starting as early as ninth grade. And uh, you are very proactive about setting students up for success. So can you talk a little bit about the levers that you can pull there and, and how to be more proactive rather than reactive about student success? Certainly. Yeah. So to give everyone a little more color on how our platform works, um, students are able to earn scholarships and grants towards college as they go throughout high school for uh, the behaviors and milestones that we've seen lead to college success down the road. Um, so they're able to essentially build up this piggy bank that they can then redeem when they go to college. Um, we're uh, in the fifth year of having it live and have over a, a million current high school students participating in the program and collectively they've gotten about $4 billion in aid uh, through it. Um, when we think about the student's journey and making sure they're prepared for college, we think about three major areas. One is uh, financial readiness. Uh, we know for students and families, this is one of the biggest gaps today, uh, making sure they understand the full cost of college 
and uh, what are the different funding sources that they can uh, apply to make it through there. And I think what's notable about that and uh, something we put a lot of emphasis on the platform is uh, making sure they have uh, sustainable financing as well. So if they're receiving scholarships or grants from third parties uh, or from the university itself, it's not just in their first year of uh, college that that's a renewable award um, and, and they understand the full financial picture. Uh, that's obviously extremely complex uh, and there's a lot of challenges baked in that we could spend the entire panel on. Um, but uh, second is uh, making sure there's academic uh, preparation and uh, the way we think about uh, the, the impact Raise Me can have is uh, thinking about what are the different steps throughout the journey that students can be taking to become better prepared for college, whether that's um, taking college level courses, dual enrollment, AP, um, uh, uh, those types of things while they're in high school to better prepare for college. Um, we're creating programs that incentivize and connect students to those resources. Uh, and then the third part is making sure they're um, preparing uh, socially and emotionally um, for college as well. Um, so trying to find ways to connect them uh, uh, and hear from students that are already in college, students that are like them, uh, helping incentivize ways uh, for them to also uh, just um, engage with their peers through extracurricular activities, service projects, things like that. Got it. And, and for the rest of the panel as well, uh, as you guys weigh the importance of getting the student to entrance and then bridging them from entrance to completion, uh, how do you see the responsibility of the educator evolving from, from preparing them to enter college to getting them through college? Who's the onus on? So um, just a quick frame, uh, Wayne State University is located in Detroit, Michigan. Um, so we have been ground zero for a lot of educational reform at the secondary level. We also have been there for 150 years. We're 27,000 students, a comprehensive R1 institution. We formed the Triangle with Michigan and Michigan State for research in the state of Michigan. Um, and about six years ago, we were really struggling with that completion question. And so my work wife, Monica Brockmeyer, is in the audience, and she is the Senior Associate Provost for Student Success at Wayne State. And so she is my other half in that she works in helping students um, complete. Um, we also work in netting those services around. And one of the things that I also wanted to frame for you, we talked about the expense that students have. If you think about where students are in the economy, the number one most expensive thing that most people buy in their lifetime is what? A house. The number two most expensive thing that people buy is a college education. And you think about the number of people in our current economy who cannot afford a house, and we are asking them to borrow money and to go to school in order to get an education. And so one of the things that, that Hans, I know Monica and myself, is when we're bringing students in and we're asking them to borrow money and we're asking them to do this, how sure are we that we're going to be able to get them out the other side so then they are able to pay back that student debt because we don't want to leave them worse. And so a lot of what we do in, in partnerships with, with different companies like Raise Me and, and MidHub is the nudging behavior and moving those students forward. We can only move the student so far we as an institution have to be ready to adapt. And so I'm all about analogies and stories. And so the analogy that I would give you is I love to fish. This is not a native Detroit accent. I did not grow up in the city. I love to fish. We in higher education are the only group of folks who could walk up to a lake that has dead fish everywhere. And we would look at it and say, what is wrong with those fish? Because we do that every day in higher education. We walk up to the edge and we look at those students and we say, what is wrong with that student that they could not be successful? We need to be looking at the water, folks. We really do. What are we doing in higher education? How are we incentivizing behaviors? You know, we have had a complete transformation on our campus with student success. We've grown 21 points in seven years. That's the fastest growing rate for any large public institution. And we did that not by one single thing. 
we did that, again, here's another analogy for you. There are no silver bullets. There's only silver buckshot. And if you know anything about hunting, you scatter gun that approach and you bring in and you hit a hundred different areas. And so that is what we did. And so all of these, these great folks, when they're up here talking, you have to start with the focus on the student and the student's success. And you have to focus on completion. Don, that, that, thank you for that. That's great. Um, and, and by the way, I think Don is a little too modest to, to state this, but Wayne State University was awarded the uh, 2018 Project Degree Completion Award for right. nearly doubling uh, completion rates in six years. So congratulations to you for that. And Monica Brockmeyer. <laughs> Way. Take a bow. Can I build on that, Don? Um, because certainly without a doubt, dollars and finances are the number one external factor for student success. Uh, and academics and grades um, and the struggles in the classroom are probably uh, close behind as external factors. But the thing we do at my company, uh, it's not a tool for broadcasting so much as I like to say listening at scale. Uh, and students talk to us and they reveal sometimes very personal things. And when they do so, it reminds me, or at least it harkens back my own college experience. I had every single affordance in life. Um, I come from an upper middle class background. Heck, I didn't even go to college that far away and I went to a pretty darn good one. Um, but even still, while I was there, I remember thinking like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, and I come from a dramatically different background than most of the students we serve who are first gen, low income, minority backgrounds, um, who maybe have no one in their lives telling them they can. Uh, and when they whisper into their smartphones with their thumbs, telling us uh, the struggles that they have, I, I begin to realize that the real differentiating factor in my understanding of the problem is not so much the outside world, but the voice in the back of their head that's questioning whether this is something that's for me or whether they can do this. And I don't know how successful we are, maybe to some degree uh, the data sh says that we are, but our goal is to turn up the volume on the voice that says you can do this to some degree. It's a little like Pixar's Inside Out. Uh, you can tell I have kids at home because I might quote some more movies. Um, but all the voices in the head that contribute to who we are, and it's, it's about managing the whole life of the student. And I think so much of what we do manages the external factors or the symptoms, but the root cause is usually between our ears um, when it comes to whether or not we're going to have grit and succeed. Um, it's my two yeah. cents. I think uh, that's a great point. And, and Drew, uh, for you, you're, you're really betting on machine learning and AI to bring scalability to student success. So Yeah, I, yeah we, I mean, it's a powerful technology that I think makes possible a lot of the promise that has been made in education to date about truly giving personalized support. Um, I don't actually think it's the, the silver bullet, <laughs> but um, it certainly is an interesting engagement that we have that uh, develops a relationship and allows people to say things that I never dreamed they would ever say to us in the medium of text message. And even they say they wouldn't have said to a person. Oddly enough, the, the thing they tell us in focus groups is that I, I never would have said this particular thing to a person because I would have felt judged by them. But I told it to a chat bot. Um, I still don't fully understand why, uh, but maybe I don't have to. I, I want to add something really quickly, just so, um, you know, when I look out in this audience, I live in Detroit. This audience does not look like the students that, that we see every day and that we work with. And so you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but, but let me ask you this. How many of you were first generation college students? Okay. How many of you were Pell eligible first generation college students? Mm. Okay. So it's a totally different world. Do you know what it means in this day and age to be Pell eligible? It usually means that you have a family, usually a single parent, maybe two parents, making less than $40,000 a year with two to three children. So imagine what that family's having to live on and do. And again, we're turning around and we're asking them to do this. So a lot of students will cite financial reasons and struggles and, and so you know incentivizing those behaviors that encourage them. But I think you're exactly right, the imposter syndrome. 
students, you know, really don't feel that higher ed is connecting with them. And I shared earlier where that becomes an even bigger issue is in the Midwest and actually even on the coast as you look at the, the declining birth rate. So if you haven't looked at the demographics, you should. There's a huge declining birth rate, and that means that there will be less college-going population mm -hmm. over the course of the next 30 years unless people get busy making babies. All right? <laughs> So, and that's what- You heard it here first. Good job, <laughs> yes. making, some, making some babies there. So, but the problem with that is, is if we as a nation want to encourage economic growth, we have to find different ways to engage with students who haven't been engaging in higher ed previously, and we have to be able to support them through that process. And currently, the system we have does not support them. So individual coaching um, activities, individual nudges, will help us eliminate some of that imposter syndrome. But folks, we have a wake-up call. It is literally um, ap apocalyptic, what we're looking at as far as the decline in the American education system. And what's going to happen, we are going to see more and more um, higher education institutions close because they have not been able to adapt to the students who are coming out of the secondary school system. We're also not meeting the needs of the employers and what they're looking for. So, so these I, guys are, are these y'all are my hope. So I'd like to uh, dive into that and then open it up to, to John to react, actually. Um, so going back to the last six, seven years at Wayne State, what are some of the, the strategies or the tactics or the tools that really move the needle? What combination of actions really um, led to to the results that you saw. I know it's, a, it's, it's an amalgamation of everything. So but. I would say the first big tipping point for us was the addition of um, 50 new advisors across the campuses. We have both a centralized and a decentralized advising system. And so they were able to not only spread those advisors out, but also engage faculty advisors in a very different way. We have a professional advising academy. So that got the ball rolling. We also, we have um, 13 different unions on our campus, but our faculty is highly unionized, and as you know anything about higher ed, faculty owns the curriculum. We just went through general education reform on our campus, hadn't happened in 30 years. So we have a very strong team in the provost office and we were able to do that. We also restructured our financial aid. There's a huge myth that you either get need-based aid or you get merit-based aid. There's a whole lot of smart kids who also happen to qualify for need-based aid. It is not a single circle on a Venn diagram. It is not low-income, first-generation, underrepresented minority in one big circle, folks. There's lots of intersectionality between that. So being able to meet students where they are in their comfort areas and their comfort groups, we've been able to really take our services out to them. So we work with RISE. We have a new program called VIP, which is a vision and impact practice that is in its pilot stage, look at Monica Brockmeyer, <laughs> has eliminated the black-white achievement gap on our campus for first year, for first time freshmen. That's, That's awesome. huge. We get a round of applause for that yeah. one. <laughs> so it is 50 different things. But the thing it really is, is a campus that is all going in the same direction. So we have faculty working on things and advisors and staff members. We eliminated 80 different holds on our campus through our financial aid office, figuring those out, really doing the investigation, and restructuring the aid so that we were able this year, out of a freshman class, our biggest freshman class in history, in a declining market, we were able to grow 15% in our freshman class, and we gap funded over 1,200 freshmen where they had zero out-of-pocket expense for tuition and fees, and we did that while increasing our net tuition revenue. We doubled it in the last four years. So there is a business case for student success and for doing what the moral imperative tells us we need to do. John, so, <laughs> drop the mic. Uh, I would, um, I, I agree with a lot of what we're saying. I, I view it from a slightly different lens. 2U supports online education, and we partner with most of the best institutions in the US, so we're really focused on the convergence of technology and the human touch. And I know, Drew, you hit this a little bit, um, and, and we heard the loneliness part, Sian, in your beginning. Uh, from, from my perspective, what we're really focused on retention is the one number that binds everything we do. 
We have roughly 300 people around the world, extremely diverse background because our student base is very diverse online. In fact, it's more diverse than what we see on campus for the institutions we support. I completely agree there's no silver bullet. What I would say is, going back to the motivations for the students from their first interaction with us, and we learn why they want to get their degree and how they want to transform their life through education, and taking that initial conversation all the way through so when they're having tough times and there's financial challenges they're working through or something where life gets in the way, we can always go back to their motivations. A big difference from the online perspective is the sense of community. A lot of people stop out because they haven't built up that sense of community with their colleagues. So technology to ensure you can have social groups and stay engaged, the fact that you can have synchronous and asynchronous learning, you can stay in touch with students, uh, arguably easier in the technological world and track everything they're doing at a micro level. And then where we've seen really good success is spending a lot of care and feed in openly around our student success advisors. So we found that when they're very happy, they're very mission motivated, they give a damn. Um, it actually helps us a lot with the retention side of it. But we look through it that behind every stat, there's a human and we want to know their story, be able to shepherd them through their journey to graduation. Because arguably there's nothing more important than someone starting their education and helping them get there. Um, you mentioned nudges and pokes and prods. Technology, from a scalable perspective, in my opinion, is really the piece that enables you to do that. So you can see when someone is at risk, you can see they haven't logged on to the platform, and that allows you to know when to reach out to them with what mode to ensure that you're helping them stay on their journey. So it's just, it's a little different when you, when you handle it in a really scalable world on the online side. You have to think through things like sense of community and diversity a little differently. Um, but I would agree, there is no silver bullet. There's a whole lot of things you have to do to focus on it. And it really does take a village in this area to, to produce a satisfied graduate. Got it, thank you. Um, speaking of the, the human connection and the need for um, <laughs> advice and guidance, um, I'd like to ask you a question, Andrew. Um, you know, Wyzant has really leveraged technology to bring the human connection to scale um, and has a role in supporting the academic, social, and emotional, the success of students. Uh, what, what is your take on your ability to to bring that into, into every school, into every environment? Yeah, so we have learned a lot in the last couple of years partnering with universities and, and OPMs, including 2U. Um, and there's a, there are a couple of themes that seem to cut across all the partners uh, that we've talked to. One is uh, identifying the at-risk students, which we talked a little bit about. And I think we've made a lot of progress as a system using data and, and technology in order to do that. Um, a lot better at scale, because uh, it needs to be not just uh, surgical, but also timely. Um, and the second piece is engaging with those students, which is not trivial. I think we often overlook that. Um, some schools are better than it than others, and certainly there's a huge human element there, and we're talking about advisor-centric models. Um, there's also a technology aspect. I think we have both sides of that represented here. Um, and then finally, you need to intervene, and that's sort of where Wiseant comes in. And um, just the depth and, and complexity of these academic, social, and emotional gaps that these students have, I think it, it, at this level, when we're talking about intervening, it's a bit of a fantasy to think we can just throw technology at that problem. Um, it, you know, they require something much more personal and consistent. And uh, so now the question becomes, how do we do that at scale? Um, and there are two problems there. One is actually the delivery of that many resources across that many dimensions for all these students. Uh, and that's sort of what we built over the last 14 years with our marketplace on the consumer side with 75,000 tutors um, and the ability to match with somebody who's the right fit for you. And then there's how do we do it cost effectively, right? Um, this is not an inexpensive intervention. You're talking about at least six hours is what we see to, to move the needle uh, between a tutor and a student, so a couple hundred dollars. Um, so you need to be, again, super targeted with, with who you make that available to. Uh, it needs to be the most at-risk population in order to maximize your ROI. And, um, you know, and again, data comes back around here. So ultimately, it's, it's the intersection of, of technology, data, and, and people is where we're going to find the solution, but it's very nuanced. Um, but I think we are making great progress. Can I ask you a question? I started my career in tutoring. I think I mentioned that to you before. And the thing that always frustrated me so much, no matter how much we marketed, we could never get people to show up for tutoring until after they got their first like C or D on the midterm. I remember like, passing out flyers that said the organic chemistry class, and literally no one would pick up the phone and call me until it was, frankly, a little too late. Not too late to rebound entirely, but 
I would have wished they came to me two weeks before and they could have prevented that from happening. Do you guys think about the, the, the preventative medicine in, in that regard? How do you work on that? Yeah, so two thoughts. One is every school has their, their killer cor courses or their dirty dozen or whatever they call them, yep. where they know, this, and the students frankly know that organic chemistry is gonna be the killer. And, and they are, that is when you know, they can get out ahead of it a little bit on those courses, I think they're, they're tuned in. The other one, it goes back to people. Um, you know, uh, John can attest to this. We, we've seen some of the partners that we make tutoring available to, um, like crazy engagement, 35% of the students using a wise and tutor, um, because I think what they, they realize is that, and especially when it's being paid for by the institution, um, it, it's sort of exactly what they need at that moment in time when they're really struggling. Um, so, but I, it also goes back to the, the humans making it available, the nudging, mm. which I think you could take a technology approach to as well. Um, and it needs to be sort of a multi-channel marketing approach, I guess would be the, the final piece I would say. It's like, uh, it's not trivial to get people to engage. I would also say online, you don't have to wait until the student gets that bad grade and reaches out to you. You can identify the micro transactions that are behind it and you can actually proactively outreach to them to say, would tutor and help you before it becomes like, it doesn't always have to be them raising their hand to ask for help. You can actually track them really well with the system. You can know how they're doing. You can see the warning signs, build retention flags, build risk factors, and proactively outreach to them so that they never get that C grade because we've already put tutor in or some other um, outreach in play. But just last thought, for every school where we've seen a lot of engagement, we have another one where there's been almost no engagement. Um, so it, and it, you can't just generically reach out and say, hey, here's a resource for you. It has to be super personalized and targeted and you know, persistent. Uh, it doesn't just happen. I also I? think that institutions have to be willing to steer that a little more than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us came of age in an education system where it was kind of you know Disneyland. So you went, you could pick your major, and you could have all these experiences. And now, because of the limits on federal financial aid dollars, sometimes because of you know the pressures that we see from parents. So students, first generation students, are most likely to seek their course advice and their help when they are struggling from a class from whom? Do you know? Their parents. That's a really scary statistic because if a student is a first generation student, their parents didn't either complete college or maybe both parents didn't go, and that's where they're going for their advice. So I think as institutions, we need to steer them into situations where they are learning how to college. And we are not doing a good job of that as a higher education ecosystem in steering students where they need to go for these services. And we've set up kind of these archaic ways of where we're admitting students, we're saying you're prepared, but then we're not really prepared to receive them and provide them with prescriptive solutions before there's a big problem. Because Don, so, you probably know this better than any of us, but many of these at-risk students, they don't know how to ask for help. No. They don't know that it's okay to ask for help. They have, that behavior hasn't been modeled. So that's sort of the population you're, you're no. trying to address. We would arguably go even a step further that even if uh, they do know it could be valuable for them to take the time to get the support, there are many, many competing demands on their time, uh, whether it's work, other academic work, social in, uh, engagements. Uh, students have so many competing things uh, for their time. And so um, this is one of the things we've learned working with Don and the team at, at Wayne State, and we're excited to explore is how can we um, proactively get in front of students even more, not just identify what interventions will be helpful, but actually incentivize those as well um, so that uh, they're more likely to take advantage of them. We, we did a, a, we looked at our, our student um, survey, our incoming student survey. Higher education institutions have the information. Sometimes we don't always look at it. And we assumed that because we were putting opportunities out there and that students weren't coming to them, that they weren't interested in them. And that was wrong. So especially for our first generation minority students, they were actually more receptive to some of those intervention services. But again, we weren't connecting where they were. But by going to organizations, like I said, the affinity groups where they were already comfortable and taking those services, then it normalized the behavior of utilizing those services and utilizing those tutoring services so again they weren't struggling with what was between their ears as far as the imposter syndrome. So the information is there and I think students are willing. We just have to go to them with the services. I agree and that's why I think it's really important that the advisors build up a great relationship with the students. 
so then they can recommend the scenarios that they might not have thought of on their own, and it's very much a trust relationship. So once they've built rapport with them, it could be, hey, I think tutoring may make sense for you in this scenario, and they're open to it because they have such a strong relationship with the person that's advising them. Yeah. There's also this sense that so much of the communication from the school is remediation. Oh, you need to do X, you have this problem, like we need, like I'm reaching out to you to tell you to do something. That's why I love what you guys do, Preston, because you're rewarding the good behaviors and you're calling attention to those and celebrating the moments where they've done something good. I mean, it's both carrot and stick to some degree. Um, all we can do is send an animated GIF of Tina Fey making it rain money when you finish <laughs> your FAFSA. Um, but you can actually give them money, which is pretty remarkable. What a, what a, it's not about the incentives so we much. We can do it, but uh, well, that's true. They can do it. Wayne can do it. Yeah. But you can point them in the right direction, or you can call attention to the behaviors. And it's, a, I think, it's a good point to positively reinforce the things that are leading to success, rather than only point out the negatives. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, this has been a great discussion. We have a little bit under ten minutes left, so I just kind of like to go one by one and ask the uh, the clean slate, blue sky question, which is. Um, you know, if you're unfettered or untethered from the, the realities of, of time, money, resources, technological constraint, um, over the next few years, what would you do more of? What would you do differently? What do you envision your businesses or your organization or your school's role to be in fostering student success? You going down the line? Anybody? That's a tough one to start with. You went this way last time. You go first. You're good. <laughs> um, well, I would say, first of all, um, I'm going to just, while well, I think about the answer to that question, I'm going to answer, um, add one more thought to the previous conversation, <laughs> sure. which is that the, another lever, if for anyone out there that's trying to get student engagement, is peer-to-peer. -peer. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about that. Um, <clears throat> that's where we've seen the most traction is when you have some students that have success and they validate it for, for other students. Um, so, blue sky question. Do you want uh, me to take it first? Yeah, please, I, man. Because I absolutely <laughs> hate this question. Um, no offense. No I should have said this when we were preparing. Um, because I actually think like the scarcity of resources and the constraints make the solution more beautiful. Just like a, a sonnet has a structure and it allows you to put creativity within the frame, or a basketball court has boundaries and rules that allow for improvisation in that way. I think, frankly, like solving the problems that face the higher education in our society, frankly, within the confines of scarcity is kind of the whole creative game. And actually, the more pertinent question, maybe slightly less interesting. Um, but for me to answer it in that context, which is the question I want you to ask me, uh, <laughs> it's to focus on how can we give people back time? Like all of our effort is about um, driving greater efficiency in helping the people who are on these campuses doing the amazing work, the advisors who are, are frankly in, in the trenches with students battling out hard problems to help them succeed to give them the time to dig deep on those like, human to human connections that frankly um, could never be replaced. Um, that, that's the, the goal that we would have and that's my vision for myself and hopefully for anyone else who's out there thinking about a company um, or a solution to a problem. Anyway, that's my I, two cents. I'll take my turn again. Do it. Thank you. So I guess just, just super quickly what I'd say is that as we look ahead, uh, I think what we need to get to is a world where we're being much more surgeon. I think, sur let's go to analogies and metaphors. Let's think about a surgeon. Right now we use blunt instruments, yes. um, largely, and I think we're, we actually have the ability with technology and data and machine learning um, to, to have every student have an experience that's tailored for them. That, that like actually is possible. It's really hard to do. Um, but certainly I think we need to keep moving in that direction. And having the right support you know, at, the, at the exact right time is going to be a key piece of that, and uh, that's you know piece obviously Wiseant would uh, you know like to be a part of. I agree with that. I think, and actually, I think we're we're close to this in many ways. I would want to have an extremely diverse team that's highly motivated, that's very mission minded, and I would layer as much technology as we could on top of that to be sure that even before a student realizes they're about to hit a problem, we already know what the right mode is to reach out to them, whether it's a text message or through social or an email, whether it's a phone call. Uh, openly, there's some students in programs that are just doing so well, we actually slow them down if we reach out to them too much. So for me, it's really leveraging data 
so that we, we reach out to them at just the right time in the right mode with the information we need at that specific moment to help them get past a hurdle that they didn't realize was in front of them. Do you want to close this out? Yeah, she needs to drop the mic moment. <laughs> so um, I have several things. Um, my, my, my biggest dream would be that we would actually fund education in our country. So we really, we don't at any level. We don't fund it at elementary, we don't fund it at secondary, we don't fund it at higher education. So everybody's out there scrambling for the dollar, scrambling for the student. Um, so if we actually funded education, that would be kind of my, my biggest dream. It shouldn't, you know, I'm way, way liberal, I understand that, but, but I would do that. But the other thing that I would do is begin to instill in all children that they can go to college and that they can do these things. You know, we talk about college isn't for everyone, and I'm like, why not? You know, where do we fail students along the way that we say, oh, well, you know, maybe college isn't for you. And so living in the city of Detroit, working in an institution in the city of Detroit, do you know that there are the same number of valedictorians and, and amazing students born in the city of Detroit as there are every day in the city of Ann Arbor where the University of Michigan is? Do you know what stands in the difference between those two is opportunity, funding, and community support. I have never lived in a state that wanted to see its main metropolitan area fail so, so spectacularly. So Detroit has had funding sucked from it, we've killed the school systems, we've done all of these things, and so what we have done, people talk about the Flint water crisis, I'm sure you've heard of that. The educational crisis in the state of Michigan, particularly in the city of Detroit, is far worse and covers far more generations than the Flint water crisis does. It is criminal what has happened. We have third graders who have dropped out of the educational system and nobody in the state of Michigan is tracking them. So if I had my druthers, we'd fund education, we'd care about it, and you all would be out of work. Okay? Because if we really gave children and students the chance to be successful and they had those tools, we wouldn't need all these interventions on the back end. The other thing, if there is anybody in the room who wants to write me a check, okay, help me figure out and help me scholarship ways to get people of color in second and third grade classrooms, especially men. Yes. If we could do that in minority communities where there are underrepresented folks going to colleges and we could let children of color know that they are worthy of an education, they have the opportunity, and that people actually give a damn about their academic success, we could change a lot. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.